Before we begin, we would like to extend tremendous gratitude to Shira Lane and the entire team behind the documentary, Got the Facts on Milk, who compiled a lot of the information and interviews present in this episode. We would also love to thank Dr. Colin Campbell for his work involving casein and the Forks Over Knives documentary team for assembling the research in the way that they did. We highly encourage watching these films, but for those shorter on time, here's the abridged version. As we explore deeper to the recesses of our physical health, it's time that we looked at one of the last major giants in the food industry and part two of the animal foods category, dairy. For most of us, we've been raised to believe a lot of great things about dairy. It's nature's perfect food. However, there is now an overwhelming amount of new research and scientific investigation which paints dairy in a different light, almost showing that for every belief about the benefits of dairy, the opposite appears to be true. So what's the deal? Is milk and dairy in general really all that good for us? As with the last video, before we begin, we'd like to establish the following critical points. Firstly, we're talking about dairy today to share the scientific results that have been gathered regarding the effects of dairy on our health. As usual, we won't tell you what to eat or not to eat, just outline the research and let you decide for yourself. Second, we want to encourage you to listen to your body and do what feels right for you, always. And finally, we're presenting this information to bring awareness and love to the topic of food and health. Our focus today is specifically on dairy and health rather than vilifying the dairy industry or making bad guys out of farmers, though we will be touching on the common practices in the industry in order to get the complete picture of what is going on. Shall we begin? The production of milk. In order for a cow to give milk, she has to give birth to a baby calf. This starts the lactation process. Immediately after birth, the calves are separated from their mothers. Most female calves become replacement milking cows and male calves often become veal. The calf goes and lives in its own little house, which is a measure to prevent disease, and the mother can't stay with the calf anyways because she's got a milk. She has all of this milk for her calf that she has to give, which the farmers then hook up to machines to do the milking for them. This process goes until the mamas cannot meet their quota anymore, and they are sent to the slaughter to become beef. The calf then is fed not by her mother's milk, but with the industry's produced unsellable milk, which is milk with high levels of infection, which the companies deem not fit for sale to humans. What happens to the milk from the sick cow? Those, we, we actually, what we do, we pasteurize that and feed that to, to the babies. The mothers will often also be injected with a hormonal additive called BST, or bovine somatropin, also called recombinant bovine growth hormone, which shortens to RGBH, which reports to increase milk production by 10%, but also has received criticism from scientists, farmers, and consumers due to making the cows sick and the dairy products becoming unhealthier for consumption, by increasing risk of cancer from high levels of IGF-1, which is insulin-like growth factors. Canada and Europe have banned the use of RGBH. However, in the United States, its use is common practice, and the FDA has banned labeling milk as RGBH-free, so it's very difficult to tell what milk is safe to drink at all. The cows are also then often injected with antibiotics, which then makes its way into the milk that we drink. Finally, before being packaged and brought to the supermarkets, milk is pasteurized, which means heated to about 65 degrees Celsius for 30 minutes. This is done to destroy potentially dangerous germs and prevents the souring of the milk to make it last longer. However, in the process, it also destroys all of the beneficial bacteria and destroys the nutritious constituents within the milk, thus leaving you with a substance that is mostly devoid of nutrition. Breaking down the beliefs. For nearly a hundred years, milk has been advertised as nature's perfect food. So perfect, in fact, that this US government film from the early 20th century recommended that infants that have just been weaned from their mother's milk should be immediately switched to cow's milk. Today, it's not uncommon to see ads on the TV or internet which portray milk as something which will help you lose weight, make your bones strong, prevent heart disease, good for your skin, stops cramps, builds your muscles, makes you taller, and makes your teeth strong. When you take a break, make it milk for vitality. <laughs> But the truth seems stranger than fiction. New research and investigation by many prominent nutritionists, doctors, and physicians have strongly linked dairy to causing eczema, arthritis, osteoporosis, prostate cancer, breast cancer, asthma, and acne. There have also been reports linking dairy to childhood diabetes, intestinal bleeding, bovine leukemia, which is an AIDS-like virus, as well as heart disease, anemia, and increased allergies, which is basically the opposite of everything that we believe to be true about it. So how can that be? In order to understand the answer to this question, we have to take a step back and objectively ask what is dairy? 
and what is really going on in our bodies when we consume it. Breaking down dairy. Milk in general is a very interesting topic from the perspective that we, humans, are the only creature that drinks milk beyond the age of weaning. Perhaps what's even stranger is that we get it from another species entirely. And strangest of all is probably that biologically, our bodies are not even designed to process dairy. Following our evolution, it doesn't seem to make sense why we do it. When we look back to where and when dairy started, it appears to have begun in Central Europe, probably about 7,500 years ago or earlier. And one theory for why it started suggests that it began for the vitamin D, which normally comes from the sunlight, but where in certain Northern latitudes, there isn't much sunlight all year round. The word dairy is actually a name coined hundreds of years ago for a building or environment used for the production of butter and cheese, and which since has been adapted to describe all animal milk related products, particularly cows, but also goat, sheep, and even camel. Contained in the milk are a number of different ingredients. There's water, carbohydrates, mostly in the form of lactose, there are two main protein categories, caseins and whey proteins. Then there are fats, vitamins, and minerals, hormones and growth factors. And finally, there are white blood cells. Let's take a closer look here. Lactose. Lactose is actually a sugar, milk sugar, and comprised of two molecules, glucose attached to galactose. When mammal babies are born, we have an enzyme in our system called lactase, which breaks these two molecules apart and we absorb them individually. After the age of weaning, however, that enzyme is lost because we no longer need or use it. This is a justifiable explanation for why 75% of the world's population are lactose intolerant. Biologically, we're not supposed to be digesting it. When a sugar is consumed that the bowels cannot digest, it goes first through the small intestines where it's supposed to be digested, but isn't. Then it goes into the large intestines and ultimately just sits there, giving you gas and cramps. This also often causes diarrhea because the high sugar content draws water into the bowels. A small percentage of the human population, however, in the genetic chain have experienced a mutation in the LTC gene, which allows for the digestion of lactose as adults. And as exciting as genetic mutation might be, the only superpower associated with this mutation is the ability to drink milk long after weaning. Proteins. The next category we're going to focus on with the ingredients in milk are the proteins called caseins and whey in a ratio of 80% casein and 20% whey, close to the opposite of what the human breast milk protein ratio is. What's very interesting, however, is that it's these proteins which scientists are linking heavily to the creation of cancer in the human body when consumed. One scientist who has done extensive work on casein and animal protein is Dr. Colin Campbell, whose work we touched on before with the China study. For Dr. Campbell, his research had started much earlier before he learned of the cancer atlas and took his work abroad. In 1975, Dr. Campbell was at Cornell University investigating the effects of casein, the primary protein found in dairy, on the body. Campbell had two sets of lab rats. One set he fed a diet of 20% casein and the other half he fed 5%. Over the 12 week study, the rats eating the higher protein diet had a greatly enhanced level of early liver cancer tumor growths. Of the rats in the 5% group, none of them showed any signs of tumors at all. Dr. Campbell decided to take these findings a step further and gave a single group of rats alternating dairy protein amounts every three weeks, switching from 20% to 5% and back and forth. The results were astonishing. When they were given 20% protein, early liver tumor growths exploded. When the same rats were given 5% protein, tumor growth actually went down. It was after this experiment that Dr. Campbell would finally get to research the same effect on humans with his China study and ultimately validated his research a hundredfold. It's worth mentioning too, that Dr. Campbell also discovered that plant-based protein, such as that which comes from soybeans and wheat, even at high levels, did not cause any tumor growth whatsoever in any of his experiments. This notion is also observable when we look at all of the countries of the world together. Out of the top 20 countries with the highest milk consumption, many of them also appear on the highest cancer rate list. Calcium. What do you think the most important nutrient we get from dairy products is like milk? Calcium. 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 Calcium? Calcium. 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 Or calcium. 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 That used to be the TV commercial in England. Milk is calcium. -y. And while it's true that dairy does have calcium, it's also true that the best sources of calcium actually come from fresh vegetables. Vegetable calcium is absorbed about twice as well as the calcium in milk and has the bonus of containing fiber, folate, iron, antioxidants, and the bone health superstar, vitamin K. But wait. Isn't dairy still good for the bones? Well, there's actually two factors involving the dairy and bone health notion. 
The first is actually that the pasteurization process of killing bacteria also makes much of the calcium contained in raw milk insoluble, which can lead to rickets, bad teeth, and nervous troubles, as well as causing defects in the formation of bone and brain cells. Further, and probably even more serious, if we jump back to the animal protein that we just looked at, it has been linked with bone degeneration. And so even if there is bone supporting calcium in milk, there is an even higher rate of risk of bone degeneration. Here's the science of how that works. Basically, animal protein creates an acid-based environment within the body, which creates a disease-like condition called metabolic acidosis. This disease occurs when the body's pH level is far too acidic. When we have this condition, our body draws upon its top acid buffer to protect our bones from the acid. And that acid buffer is the calcium in our bones. The calcium is then extracted to neutralize the excess acid and our bones become weakened. You know, the higher the dairy consumption in different countries, the higher is the risk for osteoporosis. It's not the other way around. Like the dairy industry, I mean, they've been getting away with that yarn for quite a number of years now. And they found that the countries where they were consuming the most milk, the countries where they're consuming the most calcium, had the highest hip fracture rates. It's actually opposite of what you would think. At Harvard, the Nurses' Health Study tracked women, more than 70,000 women, for over 18 years. What they found is those who drank the most milk had absolutely no protection against hip fractures at all. The idea that calcium is going to build strong bones is a myth. As the science of this was discovered, many national health organizations turned to defend the health benefits of milk by recommend that we consume low-fat dairy products. So as the fat is taken out, the protein becomes a larger proportion of the total. So they become higher in protein, lower in fat. And when we compare these high-protein, low-fat milk products, for example, with prostate cancer, the relationship is as strong as it is for cigarette smoking and lung cancer. Today, and similarly with the meat, cows that have undergone hormonal and antibiotic injections have a much higher rate of spreading disease or other illnesses through the milk. Further, the animal protein itself, casein, seems to have a degenerate effect on the body. But as Dr. Campbell's research showed, 5% dairy intake had no problem at all, but 20% was immediately linked with cancerous tumor growths. Ideally, if you're going to consume dairy anyways, the best way to do it is probably to find a raw source of dairy from smaller organic farms and from very happy and healthy cows, and limiting your intake to about 5% of your daily nutrition. With that said, many scientists, like those that you have seen today, often simply recommend just taking it out altogether. And I'm the luckiest doctor in the world because uh, my patients get well. Looking at the meat and the dairy group, of those two groups, what should I give up? The question is, you should give up the dairy group. You'll get much better results than giving up the meat group. And the reason is, is uh, dairy is basically liquid meat. They're very similar in their nutritional makeup, but dairy has some extra problems, you know, allergy problems, uh, autoimmune diseases that they cause. Now, there's actually a lot more to share on this topic of dairy, but we're hitting our time limit for today. So if you really want to go deep, we highly recommend watching these documentaries that we mentioned at the beginning. And of course, don't forget to check out our sources in the comments. Thanks for watching and see you next time.